Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's glad to, I'm glad to see you, or almost see you. I'm glad to be here to worship together today in the way we have to do it in this particular strange time. I hope God that uh, is glorified by our worship, and I hope we are strengthened just being together and being able to think about some things that are spiritual. Is it actually possible for a man to have a human and a divine nature in one body at the same time? That's what the Bible says about Jesus during his time on this earth. And some of my brethren began to question that uh, in the past. And uh, the, in the debate, as it turned out, it, it raised some rather foolish questions. Uh, what percentage of his human body was human and what percentage of his divinity was his divine nature? And what the Bible answers very clearly, there's no percentage to it. They're both 100%, 100% man and 100% God. Matthew, uh, Jesus uh, settled the question in Matthew chapter 22, and he shows the fallacy of that kind of reasoning. You know, he said, well, you know, you can't have it. That's 200% man, and that's just impossible. The Sadducees were the modernists of Jesus' day. Uh, they did not believe in the resurrection or spirits or angels. And they concocted this atrocious story to challenge Jesus and prove that he could not be accurate about talking about a, a resurrection. They built it around the Leveretic marriage law that said if a man is married to a woman and he dies and does not leave an heir that his brother is obligated to marry her and that uh, he is to, you know, father a, an heir for his, his brother's interest. And they go through seven brothers, if you can believe it, all of them having died without leaving this heir that's there. And finally, the woman dies. And lo and behold, their, their unanswerable question is in the resurrection whose wife she's going to be for seven men at her who's who's going to be the lucky guy that draws her in heaven well jesus answers them and uh says well, well the first place your your reasoning is wrong uh you do not know the scripture uh in the, the resurrection there is no marriage or giving in marriage men are like the angels they're spiritual beings and secondly, you do not know the power of God. He is omnipotent, which means he is all-powerful, as we've learned on Wednesday night class. And uh, his power is limitless. He can do anything he wants to. If he made this world out of just words that he spoke, how, what, what, what would ever limit him? And, and so uh, the Sadducees... Uh, are sufficiently silenced. Jesus was fully human. Uh, while he was on this earth, uh, it would be obvious to any casual reader of the New Testament that that was so. He demonstrated all the human traits, uh, and I'll just give you a few examples. In John chapter 4, the Gospel of John, Jesus is going from Judea up to uh, Galilee, and he goes straight up the side, the most direct route, the east side of the Jordan, and he he passes through Samaria. When he comes to Sychar, a city there, Jacob's well is there, and Jesus sits down and he's taking a rest, and he has sent his disciples into the city to buy food. And so what does that tell you? Jesus got tired and he got hungry, and that's it. In the meantime, the woman approached him and when he asked her for water in that very significant conversation that's recorded in John 4. So, tired and hungry, those are human traits. In Matthew chapter 8, a great storm blows up while the, Jesus and his disciples are in the boat crossing the Sea of Galilee and his disciples become alarmed. They think they're going to, I guess, capsize, sink or whatever, but they're all going to be lost. And you know what they do? They wake Jesus up. He's asleep. 
huh, that sounds like another human trait, doesn't He gets tired, and he has to have some sleep sometime. And so, of course, he calms the sea, and they were amazed by that. Just the winds and the waves obey his will. Peace, be still. Uh, and he's not exempt from pain. He, You just read his seven mock trials and the persecution and, and the, the abuse that was heaped on him with a scourge and sticks and fists and every other thing until he somebody described his condition on the cross as just a bloody mess and I guess that's probably what was true but it so weakened him that he was not able to carry his own cross as they were going to let him do but uh, had to compel Simon a Cyrenian who was coming by to bear it for him and then finally in John chapter 10 verse 35 is the uh, oh, excuse me almost finally uh, John 10:35 uh, is the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept, and the reason he wept, he went uh, to see Lazarus, and he was dead. And his sisters, his precious sisters, were weeping over him, and it touched Jesus' heart, and he wept with them. Weep with those that weep, and rejoice with those that rejoice. There's one more. Thing that I think is what really is the, the, the cruncher of this thing. It says in <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 14, verses 14 through 16, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was at all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may find mercy and grace in time of need. And so it's pretty much obvious that Jesus was a human being in every sense of the word. Those examples could be multiplied. But then on the other hand, he was... He was fully God. Just two passages. One of them is probably one of the most significant passages in the Bible. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon himself the form of a servant. And being found in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of a cross. Wherefore God has highly, highly exalted him and given him a name which is every, above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every and confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. And then what Paul just says outright in Colossians 2 and verse 9, he says, In him dwell all the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. So that question is, is settled. And so I know that I, I said all of that, that uh, that's not the lesson for this morning. There's something else uh, we're going to do here. In a few minutes, we're going to read Mark chapter 7, verses 24 through 30, and look at that shortly. I want to give you two things, though, that are, are kind of extra. I'm not, I'm not going to charge you anything for either one of these. And so you just enjoy them and get what good you can out of them. Jesus could make himself unknown, as he also desired to do. Unknown to intellectual pride and opposition. He, he, it was amazing. He passed through a crowd at the synagogue in Luke chapter 4. Let me read you that. It's very interesting. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as was his custom he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah and when he had opened the book he found the place where it was written the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor he has he sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive and recover the sight of the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book 
and gave it back to the attendant. And he sat down, and the eyes of all who were there in the synagogue were upon him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. But then he went on and started talking about on some occasions where Jesus gave his attention to the Gentiles instead of the Jews, several cases of that, and uh, they became incensed then about that, and so they just decided to take him out and throw him over a cliff and kill him. And uh, it says he passed through them and, and left. I, I, could he make himself visible? He could if he wanted to, I'm sure. He could do whatever was necessary. And so uh, that's something that you can chew on for yourself and figure out how he did that. Uh, but he, he never made himself unavailable. I shouldn't say invisible. He, he never hides when the human agony, this is that other extra I'm giving you, he never hides when human agony is present and makes an appeal to him. He never turns away any who come to him in faith. So he's going to take some time out from the busy schedule and from the pressure, and he goes over into a Gentile country where he thinks he may not be recognized, and he goes to probably one of the most dedicated, idolatrous, and paganistic sections of that time in Palestine and uh, he is in the midst of that and a question arises and they, they worshipped everything Baals, Ashtaroth, Ashtaroth and, and everything else going on and there these I never tried to sort out all the uh, all of the idols of the different gods and they overlapped and had different names in different places and so it was just much too confusion for my simple brain. But why did God go so persistently and condemning of the idolaters and the pagans? Why he started that in the Old Testament and he would make fun of them through the prophets that they were, you know, pathetic. They they couldn't walk, they couldn't talk, and yet people would put their faith in them. And uh, it was just a ridiculous thing. He says he'd cut down a tree and carve an image out of it and decorate it up, and it can't walk, it can't talk, can't help you. You take the rest of the tree and go and cook your dinner with it and make a fire to cook your dinner. So, But there were three things that I read a number of years ago about common to all paganism and idolatrous re religions of supreme importance. And here they are. Number one, freedom from all restrictions. There's no rules at all. You're not bound by anything in this world. Number two, freedom from expression of human desires. Whatever you want to do, however your human nature tells you you want to do, whatever satisfies the designs of the flesh, you can do that. Back in the 60s, there was an Episcopal priest named Joseph Fletcher, and, and he came out with the idea or, that uh, God was dead. I don't know what he meant by that. I have forgotten a lot about what he said, but what, what it really meant was that God was no longer relevant in our society today. Everything he said was outdated, outmoded, and, and uh, you could forget about it and not try to live by some rules that he had set down long ago. And then the third thing is the demand to do whatever those freedoms allow. And what do you see this persistent in pagan religions? They had drunken feasts. They had religious orgies. orgies. And uh, they, they, they had uh, sexual license. Could you imagine a man going to a temple like in Ephesus or other places and having sex with a, pr a pr prostitute and, and calling that worship service. You remember the, the problem was so, so bad in Corinth that they called uh, the uh, Corinthians uh, sexual transmitted diseases the Corinthian disease. 
and it was just widespread and what a terrible thing to call that religion in any sense of the word. Independence from all opinion and law. Uh, there is complete debauchery among the pagans and no wonder Jesus, uh, God started and Jesus continued in the apostle and the prophet and they condemned this ridiculous religion, man-made religion. And people are always trying to s escape freedom from duty and restrictions. And, and this is what the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 6, verse 16. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness? Just look at the, the drug addiction and the, and the homosexuality and all of the other sins that are so prevalent in our world we foolishly call the bad things good and the good things bad and ignore what God has to say. We throw him out the window and we're reaping the whirlwind now I think for some of the things we've done. Now I'm going to read to you the the reason or the real point of this sermon okay so you listen and uh, I hope it'll hit home with you like it did me. Mark chapter 7, verse 24. From there he arose and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered a house and wanted no one to know it, but he could not be hidden. For a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him, and she came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. But Jesus said to her, Let the children be filled first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For this saying, you go your way, the demon has gone out from your daughter. And when she had come to her house, she found the demon gone and her daughter lying on the bed. Okay. So now I'm just going to read those passages a little more slowly and accurately as a, by the way and just make a comment or two about some of them by the way you can find a parallel passage in Matthew chapter 15 verses 21 through 28 and there's some things that he mentions that uh, Mark does not from there he arose and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon and he entered a house and wanted no one to know it but he could not be hidden and, and what is, is interesting, of all the places to go, that he had been there before. He, he, that's recorded earlier in, in Mark chapter 3. And uh, he knew what kind of a place it was, just total debauchery going on over there, about his idolatry and, and paganism, as bad as you could have it. It's like a disease. And uh, so he, he went away from his own people to go over there and just get away for a little while. By the way, do you remember anything particularly about Sidon? They were two great seaports, and they were seafaring men that occupied those two cities. And, and do you remember something special about Sidon? You remember an old girl named Jezebel? She was a native of Sidon, and she just happened to marry Ahab, the king of Israel. And she probably had as much to do as anybody ever had in, in, in introducing that false religion into Israel. And it caused so much trouble and so much anger and punishment from God for their debauchery. And it says, for a, verse 25 says, For the woman whose young daughter had an unclean uh, spirit heard about him, and she came and fell at his feet. 
she calls him son of David, so she obviously had some knowledge about Jesus' background and uh, knows that he was of the lineage of David, and she worshipped him. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she could have been called a, a pagan. She could have been called a Gentile. She could have been called a Canaanite. All of those terms would fit her. And, and when the Syrophoenician woman first spoke to Jesus, he just ignored her, didn't say anything, no, just silent. That's about as big an insult as you could pay somebody. They try to say something to you and you ignore them like they're just nothing and it is a humiliating experience to have that happen to you. Uh, uh, verse 27, he says, But Jesus said to her, Little children be filled first, for it is not good. To, let the children be filled first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to little dogs. <sighs> Boy, that hurts. That's about as cruel and insulting and insensitive as you can imagine by the way when they talk about little dogs they're not talking about these vicious dogs that ran loose in those days that were a danger to animals and even to people but they're talking about little lap dogs like a Pekingese or a chihuahua or whatever other there is and you put them in your lap and you feed them off the table and you don't have any qualms about doing that they're Special pets are like members of the family. And that's the kind of dogs that he was talking about that got the best things. And, and, and she said, and, and relegated her child to something that was just not worthy of, you know, that kind of attention and that kind of care. But boy, does she pull out a zinger. And she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord, even the little dogs under the table can eat from the master's crumbs, or from the children's crumbs. Now, I want to tell you something. Mothers are special. Fathers love their children. I know I love my children. I remember so often when I, our daughter was obvious that she was not going to get well. I don't know how many times I would tell you that I begged God to take me instead of her because I wanted her to live. She was still young. Relatively speaking, she had two children to raise, and I said, I'm 65 years old, and uh, I lived a good part of my life, and I'm ready, God, to face the judgment. But I think mothers have something beyond that. When they carry a child inside their bodies for nine months, there's just something special in that relationship that they have with their children. And uh, neither pride nor, or any thing, obstacle, can keep them from begging, doing whatever they have to do to try to preserve their children. And so she said that was, it caught Jesus right where it should have and what he was looking for, really. And he said to her, For this saying, go your way. The demon has gone out of your daughter. That's what he was looking for from her. For her to confess her faith. And, and he says that in, in Matthew's account. He says, Jesus said to her, Great is your faith. And that's what we know. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe he is, and the reward of them that diligently seek him. And when she had come to her house, she found the demon gone out and her daughter lying on the bed. Hallelujah. What a blessing. Just a couple of comments now, and I'm going to quit, I promise. How could Jesus refuse that when she said even the little dogs get fed from the crumbs that fall from the table that are under the table they get those and when the faith that she had evidenced all along became apparent she would not give up and then Jesus said great is your faith I love that let it be to you to desire and her daughter was healed from that very hour on so that's what she got 
no, no, no crumbs for the table. She got a full chair, share of the children's fair blessing. What about for us, as his children? We got no crumb from the table. We got the bread of life. We got the best God had to offer. We got his son who in his gift of himself for our sins made it possible for us to be forgiven and have a real hope of life after this life is over that we can't even compare with what we have here. God bless us. We got the best God had to offer. The offer's still good. Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We can help you in your quest for a spiritual relationship with your Heavenly Father. We really cherish the opportunity to do that. Thank you for listening. And may God bless you and be with you. And let's continue to pray that we will soon pass this phase and can get back to some sense of normalcy, whatever that is, in our world. No.